Turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Uh, we've been going through the book of Acts for the last uh, two months. Uh, we'll take a pause uh, from today. Then we do something a bit different next month. Uh, then we'll come back to the rest of the chapters. Today, try, I will hope to cover chapter 19 and chapter 20. Uh, then you can cover the rest in the course of the, of the year. But before the year ends, we'll go through the whole book of Acts. Now, while Apollos was, in, was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. We are in chapter 19 of Acts. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then so Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? And they say, John's baptism. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after them, after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. And Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall, Tyrannus. Lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illness were cured and the evil spirits left them. You know, as I read that verse 11, I found it quite ridiculous and I thought about our generation today. If such a thing was to happen, then people would start things like Handkerchiefs International Ministry, Aprons International, <laughs> anyway, Interglobal Ministry. Verse 13, some Jews who went around driving out demons, evil spirits, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. And they would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Then seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, not just a priest, chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now um, came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He went, uh, he sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. Verse 23. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, I know some versions say Diana, the goddess, 
who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsman. He called them together along with the workmen in related trades and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from the business, from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul was convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is danger, not only that our trade would lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her div divine majesty. And when they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized gayers and aristocrats, post-traveling uh, post companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man uh, into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. Verse 32, the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, another, and some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. You know, it's interesting. Most of them did not even know why they were. I know many were in the streets this week, but they didn't even know why they were. They were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instructional instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, two hours. Shouting, two hours. These guys were very energetic. Verse 35, the city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is a guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not to do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then... Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody. The courts are open with their uh, proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we will not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. Our Father and our Lord, we pray that as we sit to hear your word, your word will breathe life to us. Speak to us, Lord, we pray, and this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we've had this conversation for the last eight weeks, and we've looked at the, at the, at the at this series that we are calling The Church. And we are saying that church is different without you. Tell your neighbor, church is different without you. In reality, you can't ever pronounce the word church without letter U. So the church cannot be church without you. So you are very important in this church. This, this assembly of believers that we have today, this congregation that we have today, can never be a congregation if we don't have you and me coming together and forming this body that we call the church. And this church and another church and another church and another church or this congregation, another congregation and the, the deliverance church, the redeemed gospel church, the, the, um, all those other churches, Presbyterian, the, 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 the um, Catholics, uh, whoever, they all come together. All those believers come together to form the body of Christ that we call the church all over the world. And we see Paul has now become the outright leader of the church, or this, they're calling the way. You see, way is capitalized, the way. Because by then, 
they were not really known as Christians or what we call the church today. It's they, 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 were called, they were known to be following a sect that they were calling the way. And Paul is now becoming the leader because now other leaders have faded off. They are, they are fading off. And we have new leaders taking over leadership and taking over the position of leadership in this church. You know, one thing that we must always understand is that we must always be ready to hand over always to the next generation. Because generations don't last. I can guarantee you that in the next 100 years, there's nobody listening to me here who will be here. Nobody listening to me will be on this side of eternity. Just, just, just think about your great-grandfather. Do you even know him? Not grandfather, great-grandfather. Maybe he was a big guy, like he was a big man. He was a big shot during his days. He's a, a guy who would call and everybody would be like, yeah. But today, who remembers him? Nobody. So you must always get ready to prepare the next generation. In the next 20 years, anybody who is 20 will be 40. Oh, yeah. Just take your age and add 20 years. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Ah, some of you will be waiting for pension. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a fact, by the way. Some of you, some of you will, will have no reason to smile because of the needs that are that are yelling at you. There is school fees here, there is this here, there is this here. And so, so, so it's always important to know that we are fading away and will not be here forever. So it is important to always ask yourself, am I prepping the next generation? Because Paul now becomes the guy who is shining. And you can see that he's having another younger generation that he's raising. He's, he's not doing it alone. He's working with his companions, younger people, Akina Timothy, who are in their early 20s or so. And he knew that once I am gone, then another generation will definitely come. So the question is, are we ready for this? Are we ready for this? We require courage, and that's our last C. We require our ninth C. We require courage to do the church. We require courage to do the work of the Lord. And we see Paul here finding these disciples in Ephesus. And he's asking them, did you receive? They found some disciples and asked, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he's asking them, Kwani, what kind of baptism did you receive? And they, they say, we received the baptism of John. And he tells them, no, that baptism was to help you overcome repentance. And once you repent, you get baptized that way. But there is something else called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For us to become courageous, we require the power of the Holy Spirit that can transform our lives. It is only the power of the Holy Spirit that can transform your life, that can help you overcome sin. On your own, you can never overcome greed. By the way, did you know, the more you have, the more you need. Yeah? I saw someone trying to do some calculations of the amount of money that uh, our members of parliament take home. And you would think some of us would be like, Haki, if I am earning that kind of money, I tell you, I will never be corrupt. It is only the Holy Spirit who can help you and tell and, and remind you that imagine you will not be here forever. You will be here forever. So you cannot get transformed without the power of the Holy Spirit. And the church of Jesus today must always yearn and hunger and thirst after the Holy Spirit because it is only the Holy Spirit that can transform lives. You know, Paul, this guy who was sold before, who was totally sold out, a TSO, a TSO, totally sold out to destroy the church. 
when he encountered the Holy Spirit, he became a totally sold out guy to build the church. It is only Holy Spirit who can transform you. You always need to tell the Holy Spirit, transform me, transform me. Because we all come from different foundations. We all come from different backgrounds. And there is that which you are exposed to. And I think I've said that here again and again. You have your culture, you have your orientation, you have your exposure. If you do not allow the Holy Spirit to transform you, you will never become that which God wants you to become. You will always take 10 steps ahead, but your culture, your orientation, your background takes you back 10 steps back. But the Holy Spirit can transform you. How I pray that you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit that you may witness transformation that is required of you. You'll face challenges. You'll face uncertain times. The Holy Spirit can provide us with wisdom, with guidance, with comfort to navigate through all those situations. And we get to see Paul was careful to always question, did you receive the Holy Spirit? So if you find yourself struggling and never able to break loose from some struggle, ask the Holy Spirit, help me, Holy Spirit. But the second thing that we see is that Paul entered the synagogue in verse 8 and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. And actually, he stayed there for two years. Then verse 10, this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. The second lesson is that we need boldness to preach the gospel. We need boldness to preach the gospel. Paul's boldness in preaching the gospel despite facing opposition is a powerful example for us. And just like how Paul fearlessly proclaimed the truth, even when it was unpopular, we are called to boldly share our faith with others. Currently, we are becoming unpopular. We are being vilified. We, uh, everybody is talking about the church. But you know what? We ought to be bold enough to preach the gospel. It is the word of God that can transform lives. It is the word of God that is able to change. The Bible says that the word of God is a double-edged sword. It is the word of God that can transform lives. I can give you all the counseling, all the wisdom, all the what that I can give you. But without the word of God, you will never become that which God wants you to become. So we need boldness to preach the gospel of Jesus. You need to be bold enough. When you encounter opportunities to share the gospel with friends or colleagues or classmates, you can draw inspiration from Paul's courage and step out in faith, trusting that God will work through our words. So when you share your word, that's why whenever you have family gatherings with cousins and relatives, you must always share the word of God. You must always pray for them. Some of you have, some of us have siblings because I'm also included there. Some of us have, have relatives who don't look like they are part of your family or part of your, your relas. Because they've never trusted Jesus. They've never known Jesus. They've never known the way. So what you do is that you continue sharing the word of God. Continue pumping the word of God and telling them, this is the word of God. This is the truth of the gospel. Never tire. That's the word that can transform them, that can change them. Paul shared the gospel for two years. And he decided to share boldly the word of the Lord. I, are you bold enough to keep sharing the word of God? Or are you getting to a place where now you are ashamed to say that you are a believer? I say that I'll not be ashamed to say that I am a believer. I'll not be ashamed to tell them the way. They might not hear today. But they will know one day there is a prophet who told them the truth. Become bold. Be bold enough. But number three, the church needs unity and fellowship to overcome the world. Now, to overcome the world. Now, if you go to chapter 20, 
you'll find Paul in Ephesus and talking to these believers and encouraging them to remain united and to remain in fellowship. He's telling them, please, once I am gone, another prophet will come or other prophets will come that will try to divide you. And he tells them, please, make sure that you remain united. We must work towards unity. We must work towards unity. Now, let me, let me read some verse in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 to 6. I hope mine, oh, I thought it didn't have that. Okay. Genesis chapter, no, this is Exodus. Genesis chapter 11. Unity is so important, good people. See, the Tower of Babel. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastwards, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. And they said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and mortar and, and uh, tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. That's the only mistake that those guys made. They were looking at making a name for themselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. That is the second mistake. Second mistake, God does not want us to always remain to, together. He wants us to go out and share the gospel. But verse 5 says, The Lord came down and s- to see the city and the tower that the men were building. And the Lord said something very profound. If one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. It is God himself confessing and testifying and saying, if a people speaking the same language, have purpose, they have a common purpose, they have the same language and a common purpose, then nothing they choose to do or they plan to do will be impossible for them. So we must, good people, remain united. Remember those years back when there were strikes and demonstrations and people saying, our people united will never be defeated. Our people united will never be defeated. Because whenever we are united, we will not be defeated. United we stand, divided we fall. As a church, we must remain united. As a church, we must remain united. And we must always have fellowship with other brothers. Because it is when we fellowship with other brothers that we fight a common enemy. By the way, your enemy is not your sister or your brother. Your enemy is not your neighbor. No, we have a common enemy and the enemy is Satan and he knows when we remain divided, we can never win. Yes, we might have different opinions. We might have different perspectives, but we must purpose to remain united. And the question that I'll pose to you is this. Are you, how often do you attend a group? I will ask your neighbor, how often do you attend a group? Like how often? Okay, maybe we can ask, have you ever attended any? Yeah. Because we must remain united, good people. We must fellowship with others. And the other question that I'll pose to you is this. Do you serve? Are you serving? Are you serving somewhere? Ebu, ask your neighbor, are you serving that's where we, you know, by the way, it is very easy. It is very easy to look at this congregation and imagine that you don't need to serve. Because you might think we have so many people here and you're like, no, the worship team, image, okay. Now, with this one, we require specialized gifts. Yeah? But we are all gifted, good people. You have a place where you can serve. Yeah? You have a place where you can serve. 
You must step out and do which God, what that which God wants you to do. You must serve. You must, you must hang out with other people. By the way, I keep saying, if, if you tell me in this church, you tell me, Pastor, Pastor Gitao or Pastor G, I am lonely in this church. It's only that I will be a professional. I won't rebuke you. But I'll tell you, imagine that's a choice you've made. It's a choice you've made. Because if you choose to belong to an e-group, at least you'll know 10 people. Then you choose to serve in a ministry. You'll know another bunch of 10 people. Then you choose to do plug-in. You'll have another bunch of 10 people. So in this church, you'll know at least a minimum of 30 people. A minimum. And there are people who serve in two or three ministries. Because there are ministries that never overlap. So it means you can even know 550 people. Yeah, yesterday we attended a wedding of one of our associates. And it was like TCT event. I don't know if you guys observed that. Yeah, pe- people, people really came. It means that, that that lady had connected with different people here. Yeah. So, tell your neighbor, if you're lonely, chances are high. According to Pastor G's research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so so you ought to become united, good people. We must remain united. We'll be tempted to be divided by them. We'll be tempted. We'll be tempted not to fellowship with others. We'll be tempted. Unfortunately, today with the, our current culture, current culture, we have we have we are living in gated communities. We've put up walls. So it's like we need to scale those walls to come to you. Unfortunately, but we can choose and say, no, I, I, I must be united with other people. I cannot, I cannot just sit back. But finally, and I see time is not on our side, but guess the guy to blame. <laughs> just guess the guy to blame. <laughs> now, finally, through faithfulness and perseverance, we win the war. Through faithfulness and perseverance, we win the war. Paul's unwavering commitment to fulfilling his ministry, despite facing trials and hardships, serves as a beacon of faithfulness for us. Just like Paul persevered through challenges and remained faithful to his calling, we are encouraged to stay steadfast in our faith journey. We will encounter obstacles and setbacks in our spiritual walk. But we can draw strength from Paul's perseverance. He was flogged. He was persecuted. He experienced pain. But he remained faithful. It's very easy to say that we want to be the Abrahams of our generation. We, want to, we are the Joshua generation. We are, you know, I, 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 I want to be like a job. I want to be Want to be job of our days. But the question is, are, are you ready to persevere? Are you ready to persevere? And my others want to be a Solomon. With the uh, Huh? <laughs> we need to persevere, good people. We need to persevere. Let, 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 let me speak to the younger generation and tell them. When you see this older generation here, now older I mean me, because <laughs> I, I mean I'm the, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the reference here. I mean, we, 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 we all want to worship God and we want to serve God. And sometimes you might admire us, but if we share our past with you, you'll be like, I don't think I want to go through that pain. Yeah. Yeah. Now there is a quote that was crafted by the most intelligent man in this congregation today. <laughs> God does not bring challenges your way because you are strong. He brings them to strengthen you. To strengthen you. You are not his strongest soldier, but challenges make a general for him. What God does is that he does not necessarily bring that challenge because you are strong. No. It is a challenge that will strengthen you. 
After you go through that pain, then you can talk to someone else and tell them, I went through pain and here God did it for me. I am not his strongest soldier. But I know that he's raising a general. By the time you're looking at Abraham towards chapter 24, chapter 25, we are talking about a hero of faith. But what has he gone through? He has gone through hell and high waters. But at the end, he can say, glory be to God. Now today I can tell you, see what the Lord has done. It is until you persevere challenges that you will be able to stand and tell people, see what the Lord has done. Were it not for him, I will not stand and testify of his goodness. Were it not for his grace, I will not face people and tell them that Jesus is good. So challenges are not necessarily bad. They strengthen us. They strengthen us. They strengthen us. Parents who are here know that you get to a place with your children where you give them a bit of latitude. If they are boys and they are trying to climb up, you allow them to at least fall. Then they, they understand. So the same thing with our God. He'll bring challenges our way. Why? Because he knows that the challenges will strengthen you. Until you st- one day you will stand and give a testimony and tell them, see what the Lord has done. Were it not for him, I will not be here. So you must have the courage to face those challenges. You must have the courage to face those challenges. We talk about Paul today. Talk about Paul today. Why? Because he was able to persevere. And I think at the risk of being blamed for repeating my quotable quotes. 2,000 years ago, if you're walking in the streets of Jerusalem and asking 2,000 years to come, who do you think you'll remember? Will you remember Peter, Paul, and John? Or will you remember Emperor Nero and Caesar? By then, Emperor Nero, this guy who burned a whole city and blamed it on Christians because he wanted to put up his own palace. Now, that's, that's the funny thing about us human beings. Eh? We, we imagine that we'll be here forever. We want to immortalize our lives and immortalize our names. But 2,000 years later, we name our children Peter, John, and Paul. And we name our dogs Nero and Caesar. So the question that you need to ask yourself is this. Will I be remembered for serving Jesus and trusting in him and living for him and him alone? And him alone. Will you persevere, good people? Will you stand the test of time? Will you be counted? Or will you give up along the way? How I pray I was musical because I will break into a song Don't give up on God because he won't give up on you. He won't give up on you. Shall we pray? Our Father and our Lord, I want to pray for these men and women that they will be courageous enough to trust in the Holy Spirit, to believe in the Holy Spirit. I pray the lasting master that you will bless these people to remain united and remain in the fellowship of believers. Even when they are hated, they are gossiped, their name is maligned, they will remain steadfast, and they will remain firm in the faith. God, I want to pray for them, because they could be here, but they were wounded in their former churches. They were wounded in their former fellowships. And today they have purpose that they will never fellowship with brethren again. They will never be part of a small group again. Maybe as they were walking through their season of pain, nobody stood with them in their former congregation. And now they purpose they will never ever be part of an assembly. They will attend church, they will hear the word, but they will never belong to a new group. How I pray today that you will heal them. That you will heal them, Lord. 
that will heal them of a lasting master. I pray that will help them to persevere. Some of them could be going through very extremely difficult times, extremely difficult seasons. Some of them cannot even afford a six-hour sleep because of the level of stress and pain. But I pray for them that, Lord, you'll help them to persevere because that is how you make generals for yourself. Because that is how they will stand and tell people, see what the Lord has done. God, I pray that they will not give up. They will not give up on you. You can't bring them this far to leave them, God. You can't just bring them this far to leave them. Stand with them, I pray. May they have the courage to face those challenges because I know that they will persevere and overcome and give a testimony of the goodness of the Lord. God, I want to pray that you may come and fight for them and stand with them. But they need to trust in He who holds the future. He holds the future and He's Jesus. And you could be here and you've not given your life to Jesus. You have an opportunity to believe in Him today. I give you an opportunity to receive Jesus today. You're here, you know you've never made the sinner's prayer. You've never prayed that sinner's prayer. I'd like to give you an opportunity to do so. Lift up your hand wherever you are if you'd like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Lift up your hand wherever you are that you may receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says that whenever one sinner receives Jesus, or comes to the faith, there's a party in heaven to celebrate that one sinner. You can throw, you can allow the heavens to throw a party. Thank you for that hand. 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 Thank you. Thank you, my sister, for allowing Jesus to get into your life. Thank you for allowing Jesus to get into your life. Thank you for allowing him to get in your life. Thank you for allowing Jesus to get into your life. Thank you for allowing Jesus to get... He's, he's here. He's waiting on you. He's knocking at the door of your heart. Just open up your heart and you'll see what Jesus can do with your life. You can see what Jesus can do. He can transform you. He can change your story. So final call. You hear you've not given your life to Jesus. Lift up your hand wherever you are. And because he's a faithful father, he's a faithful God. He's ready to save you. He's ready to transform you. He's ready to transform your life because he's God. Final call. You're here. You've never given your life to Jesus. Lift up your hand wherever you are and we'll pray together. Our Father and our Lord, we thank you for that soul that has come to you. May you receive all the glory and honor because you know how to save and to sustain. We pray that you may sustain our sister that she may remain firm and steadfast in the faith. I pray that you bring people her way who will disciple her, who will show her and guide her and lead her and will fellowship with her even as she continues trusting and believing in you. Father, receive all the glory because you are a good Father and a good Lord. And this is our prayer today in Jesus' name. We can celebrate Jesus is a faithful God and a good Father. Let's rise on our feet that we may get to share the words of benediction. As you step out in the field, in the marketplace this week, I pray for courage to do that which is right. I pray for courage to persevere. I pray for courage to overcome. And may our good God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. I'd like you to make a prayer for your neighbor and tell your neighbor, neighbor, surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. You will dwell in the house of the Lord. You will persevere all the pain forever and ever. Amen. Shalom. God bless you.